In section two on dissolution, we learned that inside the rock, groundwater is flowing through the limestone and dissolving it. We said that water moves through the aquifer in conduits and caves, and now we'll talk about another way that water moves through karst aquifers. There are plenty of holes and conduits in the rock that water moves through, but there are also fractures within the rock. Water flowing in a conduit or cave is called conduit flow, and water flowing in fractures is called fracture flow. So, in addition to the holes in the rock and the conduits and caves that are dissolved by a carbonic acid, water also moves through breaks or fractures in the aquifer. All of these act as pathways through the rock that water can travel along. Now, in our sandstone aquifer, the water could not move through conduits. There aren't any conduits in sandstone aquifers. Water infiltrated directly through the matrix, the sand. This is called matrix flow. The same thing happens in karst aquifers in addition to conduit and fracture flow. How does groundwater move through solid rock, you might be wondering. Well, I'm here to tell you that water can move directly through rock, but only extremely slowly. Think back to our first sand aquifer. We saw how slow matrix flow was in sand. It was pretty slow. Well, imagine how much slower matrix flow is in rocks. It moves really, really slowly. Now, if you think about it, water always takes the easiest route, right? The path of least resistance. So if there are any sort of fractures or breaks in the rock, the water prefer to go along them, right? It is easier to move through a hole in the rock than through the rock itself. So basically, in karst areas, matrix flow is minimal because the water can easily move through conduits and fractures. We've learned about various karst features, including caves, springs, fractures, and conduits. The last karst feature we'll talk about is a sinkhole. Sinkholes are another way that our naturally acidic rainwater can enter the ground. Sinkholes are natural features in karst areas that allow water to move down into the aquifer very quickly. They form when part of the ground collapses. A depression is formed in the surface. Sinkholes generally look like funnels, and they act like funnels too. They direct the water into the ground. In our sandstone aquifer that we made, I said that water infiltrates down into the sand, which it did, rather slowly too, if you remember, and while filtering. Sinkholes, however, move water down to the aquifer very, very quickly, and they do not filter at all. These qualities are great for recharging our aquifer with rainwater, but there are times when things other than water moves through sinkholes, caves, and fractures and into our aquifers, like used oil, like industrial chemicals, sewage, and nasty stormwater. Ugh. When trash and chemicals get into karst features and are funneled into the aquifer, the cleanliness of our water supply is jeopardized. How we treat sinkholes, caves, and other karst features directly affects the quality of the water that comes out of your faucet or water fountain. I'm gonna say it again. When man-made chemicals, such as gasoline, diesel, or anything that you don't want to be drinking gets into our environment, our water supply is put in danger. Our treatment of these and other karst features will determine the quality of our water. If we protect our karst features, then our water will be clean. However, if we abuse our karst features, our water is in danger. San Antonio only has one water source, the Edwards Aquifer, and if we contaminate it, who knows where we'll get our water from? Why is it so dangerous when contaminants get into our water? Well, for starters, I don't want to be drinking gasoline. Remember how slow water moved through our sand model? Remember how our muddy water became cleaner after we poured it through the second sand aquifer? And remember, when I poured oil into the same aquifer, the oil clung to the sand. We said that the contaminant generally stayed put because of the low groundwater flow rates. I could clean up the oil because it essentially stayed at the site of the spill. Well, things in karst are quite a bit different. Water moves very quickly through conduits, caves, and fractures in karst. These things have large holes in them. The sandstone has small holes in it, but conduits in limestone are big. Karst does not filter water. Compared to the sand model, how well is this passage filtering the muddy water? It isn't. It's big enough for a person to get through, so how can it filter teeny tiny bits of mud? If cars can't filter mud out, how can we expect it to filter out gasoline and oil? It can't.
This is a model that shows the difference between sandstone aquifers and karst aquifers. I'm going to show you how water and contaminants move slowly in sandstone and quickly in karst. Have a look. This side of the model is a sandstone aquifer. This side is a karst aquifer. One model, two aquifers. Let's look at the sandstone aquifer first. This is the land surface. This is where cities, parks, houses and schools are. These tubes are wells drilled into the ground. I said aquifers provide people with water, right? These are wells that we pull our water out of. This is the kind of well that supplies water to our faucets and showers. This red water represents diesel that someone is going to accidentally dump into the ground. Oh no, what did they spill into the ground? Smelly diesel? Oh! Okay, so someone accidentally spilled diesel on the ground. Now we'll pump water out of the well. Watch. As I pump water out, the diesel moves down into the aquifer. Do you see how it moves down through the upper part of the aquifer? This is the contaminant infiltrating through the sand matrix. How fast is it infiltrating? Not super fast, I'll say. It infiltrates pretty slowly. What's happening? The diesel is moving through the sand into the bottom of the well. If this water were pumped to my house, what would, what would my water look like? It would have diesel in it. Gross! I don't want to drink diesel, but look. See how far the diesel has traveled? It hasn't traveled too far. It is essentially around the site of the spill. That makes it easier for me to clean up, doesn't it? I can just dig up that sand and voila, no more diesel. Now, let's look at this side of the model, the car side. This is a sinkhole on the surface. See how it is connected with the caves and conduits below? Just like in a car aquifer. Imagine that this is the well that supplies water to your house. Looks like someone's gonna accidentally spill more diesel on the ground. Oh, not again! Someone's so clumsy. And now I'm gonna pump the water out of the well that you get your drinking water from. How fast is the diesel moving through the karst? Wow, that's really fast, right? Really fast. That's one of the main differences between sand aquifers and karst aquifers. Water travels slow in sand aquifers and fast in karst aquifers. What if this was real life and I had accidentally spilled the diesel on our Edwards aquifer? Then the nasty diesel would move down into our aquifer very quickly. What if, instead of diesel, it had been a sewage leak? Then that sewage would travel very fast and very far and get into many homes. By the time I had realized something had spilled, the nasty sewage would be miles and miles away, polluting many, many more people's water supplies. Now, I have a real life story of how contaminants travel quickly in the Edwards limestone. Well, there was a limestone quarry in New Braunfels with a big diesel tank. The diesel was used to fuel up large mining trucks. A truck backed into the tank one Friday afternoon to fill up and it hit the diesel tank and made a hole in it. But no one knew the hole was there, not the driver or anybody else. Quitting time came Friday afternoon and everybody went home for the weekend. Monday, all the workers showed up and they found the diesel tank to be empty. Geologists were called and when they showed up, it was determined that over 500 gallons of diesel had spilled into the limestone ground. That's a lot of nasty chemicals to be spilled. When they probed into the ground, how much diesel do you think they found? None. Not one drop of diesel was found. Why? Because the diesel had been spilled onto limestone, that is, onto karst, and it had infiltrated below into Edwards Aquifer. The diesel did not stick to the limestone, and so the water just carried it away. All weekend long, the water carried those 500 gallons of diesel away, so by the time geologists had figured out what had happened, the diesel had been spread out over a very, very large area. The diesel had traveled over 15 miles in a single weekend. Can you believe that? Think back to our sand aquifer that I spilled oil onto. How long would it take that oil to travel 15 miles in sand? A long, long time, I'll tell you what. Longer than you and I are on this earth. Let's consider this. One gallon of diesel is enough to contaminate one million gallons of water. 500 gallons were spilled, which is enough to contaminate 500 million gallons of valuable water. We don't have enough clean water to be contaminating 500 million gallons. Now that we understand how aquifers work, I want to show you something special. We learned about how basic karst aquifers work, but our aquifer, the Edwards aquifer, is no basic aquifer. It has a series of faults and fractures called the Balconius Fault Zone that give it some special qualities. The faults and fractures break the rock up so we have three special zones within the aquifer. The contributing zone, the recharge zone, and the artesian zone. I'm going to start at the top with the purple zone, which is the contributing zone. The contributing zone is like the roof of a barn. Water falls on the roof of a barn and runs off onto the ground. 
right? In real life, the roof of the barn is a contributing zone. It takes the water and directs it onto the recharge zone. The recharge zone is the pink band. The recharge zone is a very, very special part of the aquifer that allows water to infiltrate directly into the aquifer. It is the only part of the aquifer that feeds water directly into the ground. Water cannot enter the aquifer from any other area other than the pink zone. By itself, the recharge zone isn't very big, is it? It's only a thin strip of land, right? The rainwater that falls onto the recharge zone can't provide all the water that the aquifer needs, and so the contributing zone supplements it. The contributing zone adds more water. The third portion of the aquifer is the artesian zone. This part is, it's a bit more difficult to understand, but I'll lead you through it. Sometimes, when a well is drilled into the ground, water gushes up and out. This is called an artesian well. An artesian well flows onto the surface and needs no pumping to pull the water up and out of the ground. An artesian aquifer isn't like the sand aquifer that we made earlier. A fish tank aquifer had a bottom, but it was open to the top. We were able to pour water into it, so the top was open. An artesian aquifer has a bottom and a top. Water cannot move up or down, only horizontally within the rock. In this manner, it is like a pipe. Why are parts of the Edwards Aquifer artesian? It's the Balcones Fault Zone that gives us the artesian zone. Let's check out how artesian water works. Here, I have a graduated cylinder with a hole in the bottom. Right now it has a bottom, but no top. It is open at the top. I'm going to tilt it just like the rocks in Edwards Aquifer are tilted. Now it has a top and a bottom. Now watch. When I pull my finger off the hole in the bottom, the water shoots up. This is what artesian water looks like. An artesian well shoots water up and out of the aquifer with no pump. Isn't that neat? The Balcones Fault Zone is what gives the Edwards Aquifer its artesian zone. The artesian zone is a special area of the aquifer. Most aquifers do not have an artesian zone. When the first water wells were drilled into our artesian zone, water gushed up and out of the ground. Some wells gushed up as much as 30 feet into the air. Imagine that, a water spout of water. That is how artesian pressure works. It pushes water up. We learned how different sand aquifers are from karst aquifers. Basically, it is the dissolution of soluble limestone that makes voids in the earth that allows groundwater to travel very quickly. So, karst aquifers are different from sandstone aquifers, but within the many, many karst aquifers around the world, and there are quite a few of them too, our Edwards Aquifer is very, very special. The Edwards Aquifer is very unique for the four reasons that we'll discuss here. The unique limestone rock, the Balcones Fault Zone, the unique organisms in the aquifer, and San Antonio. First, I want to talk about limestones. I want to show you some different limestones. I collected these pieces of limestone from all over the world. These are chunks of limestone from different places. What do they all have in common? Well, they're all essentially hard, gray chunks of rock. Pretty plain, really. If you were to describe it to me as boring bits of gray rock, I'd have to agree, because that's what they are. For the most part, limestone isn't too exciting. Well, they're all pretty much the same, except for this last one. What's different about it? It has all these holes in it. I can put my fingers through these holes. Water must really move fast at these rock. And where do you think this rock is from? We've seen rocks from exotic places all over the world, and they look pretty plain compared to this rock. Why is that? It comes back to all these holes. The other rocks don't have these holes. This rock, this rock came from San Antonio. This rock came from our Edwards Aquifer. How about that? Something special from my own backyard. And this rock is special. Though we may not realize it, the rock that we have here in Central Texas is very unique. I've studied limestone all over the world and no other rock comes close to what the Edwards Aquifer looks like. And let's see how this rock lends a uniqueness to our entire aquifer. Now, think back to those other limestones. How would water move through them? Well, very slowly. With no holes in the rock, only matrix flow can occur and flow directly through rock is a slow business. On a bigger scale, karst features, including caves, conduits, and sinkholes, move water. But what about the actual rock itself? This rock doesn't help the water move at all. But with this rock, the water pours right through it. Pretty amazing. So this rock helps water move faster. And 
Within the Edwards Aquifer, we have lots of rock like this, lots of it. What about filtration? We talked about how the tiny pores within sandstone filter water really well. Remember the muddy water we filtered clean with our sandstone aquifer? How do these holes filter water? Do these holes filter water? I'll say it, they don't. Water that moves through the Edwards Aquifer, our special limestone aquifer, does not get filtered. What does this mean? Well, it means that if something like gasoline spills into the limestone, it can easily move right through the rock and into our groundwater without getting slowed down or filtered at all. Okay, so I talked about the Edwards limestone and how the holes in it make our aquifer very special. I want to remind you about the Balconius fault zone that we talked about earlier. It is the series of fractures that divide our aquifer into the three zones that we talked about. The contributing zone, the recharge zone, and the artesian zone. The Balconius fault zone helps make our aquifer very unique. No other karst aquifer is quite like ours, and the Balconius fault zone is one of the main things that makes the Edwards aquifer so unique. Something else about the Edwards aquifer is that it is home to some of the most unique species of life in central Texas. Did you know that there are organisms living in the aquifer right under our feet? I know what some of you are thinking right now. Animals living in my drinking water? Ugh. Well, sort of. They are in our aquifer, but they can't get into our faucets or drinking water. There are fish, salamanders, bugs, and other forms of life living inside of our aquifer, but you will never see these special forms of life in the water that you drink. Underwater life, or aquatic life, is very diverse in the Earth. Basically, everywhere there is water, from a pool, to a creek, to an ocean, to a lake, there's life in the water. So, is it that surprising to know that there is life in our aquifer? Well, it is surprising, mainly because the aquifer is shut off from the sun. Life in the aquifer never sees light for their entire life cycle. Can you imagine that? Living entirely in the dark. I can't. Because these organisms can't exist outside of caves, we say that they are cave-adapted species, and life is very adapting. At some point in the past, some salamanders and fish living in rivers and lakes were washed into the aquifer. Inside the ground, they found cavities big enough for them to crawl around and swim in. They found waters rich in food and everything else that they needed to survive. It didn't matter to them that there wasn't any sunlight, and for some reason, they found life better in the aquifer. Eventually, they adapted specifically to live in the aquifer. Being entirely in the dark, the need for skin pigments that let them hide from predators back on the surface fell away and disappeared. Their skin went from colored to pigmentless, which results in pink to entirely white fish, crayfish, and salamanders. And since there was no light, they lost the need for eyes. Eyes receive light and convert it into images, but in the absence of light, there's no need to have eyes. So many species naturally develop to exist without eyes. The amazing thing is this. The species that live inside the Edwards aquifer can only live within the specific parameters found within their exact aquifer and nowhere else in the world. They could not be moved into another aquifer. I'll say it differently. Life that lives in our Edwards aquifer can only exist within the Edwards aquifer. Okay. So far, we've seen a number of reasons that make the Edwards Aquifer unique. Let me point to you the last one. You. That's right, you. You and I, and the rest of San Antonio, and everyone else who drinks water from the Edwards Aquifer, the fact that such a large population relies on such an interesting karst aquifer makes it even more unique. Let me ask you now, how many cities across the United States rely on karst aquifers? Plenty. How many of them have no other alternative water source? A few. But we're the only large community in the entire United States so big that relies exclusively on a single karst aquifer. If the Evers aquifer is ruined by contamination, San Antonio has no other water source. We are unique in this manner. Finally, how many have an aquifer as interesting and unique as the Evers aquifer? Not a single one. I've studied karst all over the world, and not a single one is as unique as the Edwards Aquifer. That's something to be proud of. Whew, that was intense. We learned a lot in section three. Let's review. First, we learned that San Antonio gets its water from a special karst aquifer, the Edwards Aquifer. We learned that the aquifer is unique because of four reasons. 
all the holes in the Edwards limestone. Remember how many holes are in the rock? Remember how fast we said that water would move through the rock. We said that no other limestone looks like the Edwards limestone. Next, we learned that the Balcones fault zone broke the rocks around San Antonio up and created three specific zones, the contributing zone, the recharge zone, and the artesian zone. We said that the contributing zone feeds water into the recharge zone, that the recharge zone provides water to recharge the aquifer, and that the artesian zone has pressurized water. We also learned that the Edwards aquifer is home to species of organisms that live nowhere else on Earth. They are specific to our aquifer and cannot exist outside the aquifer. And finally, the Edwards aquifer is even more unique because it has over a million people living on it and relying on it for their water source. And whether they know it or not, every person living in San Antonio contributes to and is part of the water problem within Central Texas. Within this DVD, Section 3 is one of the most important parts because this fact, among all of the karst aquifers around the world, and there are quite a few of them too, we learned that the Edwards aquifer is one of the most unique and is right under our feet. We should be proud of that and protect this unique aquifer that we have.